My guest Manoj Kumar, the CEO of Nandi Foundation, has transformed the lives of thousands of farmers across the country. Today we'll talk to him about his work at Araku Valley, we'll talk about development, we'll talk about sustainability. how the role of philanthropy fits into these two goals. Stay tuned to Pathbreakers. I am Neha Bothra. Manoj, thank you so much for joining us on Pathbreakers. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Thank you very much for inviting the Araku story to be told, which is also the story of a million tribal farmers. I know you grew up in Kerala. I also know that you had various stints at World Bank, Sidbi to name a few, before you joined Nandi Foundation as CEO. But what really brought about that desire to work with the downtrodden when you could have been at World Bank looking at various other things? What really led you to it? That's a tough question to answer, but or, or more an inward looking question, which is very personal. A lot of what we experience in our childhood leaves an indelible mark in your mind and they tend to surface at later stages in life. Um, and I think growing up in Kerala did that to me. And particularly, I would say there are two, two things that sort of affected me. One, one shouldn't forget that the world's first communist government elected was in Kerala as early as in the 1950s. Uh, and Kerala, therefore, had a vibrant society where, irrespective of which party was in power, debates on welfare economics, debates on developmental economics, debates on how do you equitably distribute things, defending natural resources and environment versus uh, development, uh, growth versus uh, protection of rights of people. The second is that Kerala also is a great place for books and movies. Even pre-teens, I ended up reading uh, Russian masters because that's what the peer told you. That's what others read. So reading all that and seeing these movies leaves questions that why do we have inequality in societies why do poor exist and and you and they just and it just saves in your mind somewhere and then i ended up in mumbai working banking sector financial sector and those questions you know sort of burp up if you please and i think that's that's where at some point, and I was lucky it happened early in life, uh, that I decided to leave everything and just uh, go and work with the poor. When we talk about the rural economy, it's the backbone of the Indian economy, we understand that. But so long, I think we've been very focused on social welfare schemes, government grants, subsidies. That hasn't really solved the problem. So where do you think the pain point is? I think it's a very deep economic policy question that you have asked and I shall refrain from commenting on how that policies in the past sort of maybe um, did not allow the rural economy to bloom or whether it helped I shall refrain from it but I'll come to the fact that rural economy is where India actually lives Absolutely. you know even now um, all the, whether it's the consumer goods industry, the automotive industry, every Indian business house and uh, economic, even stock market indices, if you see, suddenly will boom because we had a good monsoon. But really the challenges are, there is this populist political system still trying to appease rural votes by giving things on free. Uh, on, on subsidies and freebies and that could be a trade-off for us as a nation, as an economy when a large proportion of our citizens are today young. And if you are not able to create ecosystem for these young people, be it agriculture, be it trade, to flourish with entrepreneurial opportunities, I think India will hit roadblock. So to me, the pain point is how do we still create an ent entrepreneurial ecosystem for the rural folks, especially youngsters, who are sort of caught between traditional opportunities of agriculture, crafts, um, family skills on one hand, and this feeling of I, how do I get into the internet economy, etc., and not able to compete with urban well-to-do children. 
how have you tried to bring about change in the Arupu Valley? I know you started this in 2001. If you can take us through what were some milestones to trace the journey. I drew my attention to this place because a lot of really distinguished thought leaders that I met in the late 90s and early 2000s told me India has to figure out solutions for some of its dark pockets. Araku was one such. Because they will never... They it will, was the, part of the Red Corridor as well, right? Precisely. That region of Araku was very much part of the, the Red Corridor and it was at its peak of Naxal activity there. You, if you had the telecommunication tower built, it was blown up in short time. Um, the, I remember people telling me first time that do not wear a white shirt or go in a white uh, SUV because you could be suspected as government or politician and be attacked. So it was that level of uh, a kind of um, violent region on one hand. Second was remoteness. There's just one arterial road that takes you across the region. We're talking 2,500 square kilometers, a quarter million indigenous people living, supposedly forest land, and there's just one road and very sparse, very sparse electricity, etc. So in that, these kind of pockets were there across India. Some of these became dark corners. And if we didn't find ways to turn them around and create hope, there was a fear that more and more dark corners will come up. Was it easy to start a dialogue with the tribals considering that they did not trust the government and after years of being ignored and you know not being looked after by the state, uh, what was the first reaction when you actually wanted to help them? Were they receptive? When you said this, I should tell you that the first time I went for a year traveling different parts and different villages of that region, trying to connect with them when the language was also not common. I remember in one or two villages they told me that we don't trust people from India. From India? And that was an eye-opener for me. You know, that they were so remote, so unconnected with the idea of world geography. Um, they, they didn't know beyond their hamlet what life was. And it took a while of getting proximate to them, listening to them, and just hanging in there for them to get that trust because they had a history of people coming often just to exploit them or to be indifferent to them. So I had to stay in there to say, I just want to do something meaningful for you people and I have no idea how to do it. Just, just let me know more about you. That's when I learned about they all having high maternal mortality rate because they would use rusted arrows to cut the umbilical cord and the women had septicemia and died at childbirth, giving birth. So we put together as Nandi Foundation a healthcare program for maternal health, getting experts and training birth attendants, giving them kits, encouraging institutional delivery. So this connect with women um, and then worrying about these, I think in a couple of years we, we developed a bond. Manoj, I read something interesting that the tribals in the valley don't actually own the land in the sense that they can't pass it on to their children, they can't mortgage it, and yet they are free to grow what they want. How can you convince them to grow coffee? And how can you bring about a system? This question is very fascinating from the point of view that people forget the fact that the tribals here, the indigenous people here, were not farmers. They were, they were just food gatherers. They lived with the forest, had whatever the forest gave them, and very tiny pieces of land they did shifting cultivation of paddy, which was also introduced just three, four decades ago. So I had to ensure that I brought to them the right agriculture science, which not only was in harmony with their forest and the nature and their culture, but actually enhanced productivity enhanced biodiversity and ensured that we were giving back not just solutions to alleviate income poverty but also to alleviate ecological poverty. So this was the challenge. Now to grow coffee there and to bring in this element of private enterprise, profit out of their land was so difficult. What we had to tell them is that 
we'll change this region. We'll bring the birds back, we'll bring the bees back, we'll bring the fruit and trees back. But while attempting that, each one of you have to take care of a small parcel. And that seemed to resonate well, not the other way around. And the condition, therefore, from the beginning for them was, don't leave any one of us behind. So I would, we never cherry-picked which farmer to work with. We had to actually take the entire village along. So using their principle of inclusiveness, their principle and value of caring and sharing, I had to secretly introduce the idea of individual enterprise, the idea of individual excelling. And the last part is coffee was again something that came up because they told me and I looked it up, British people used to grow in 1900s coffee there. Although it's not a traditional coffee growing region, the altitude and the climate seem to have helped. And the iron rich soil as well perhaps. Be. So coffee became an interesting first option as cash crop and it allowed us the opportunity of a second crop because best way to grow coffee apart from altitude is when you have filtered sunlight and silver oak trees planted there uh, was already going to provide this automatically and we could have um, pepper grow on those silver oak trees so straight away you had two crops and both cash crops so coffee happened and automatically we had to scale up from day one so by 2005 you had thousands of farmers on board with you and that is when the cooperative was actually registered and formed. So now the challenge was that what do you do with so much coffee that is being produced, right? How did you go about that? In those days, the distances and lack of roads meant harvesting coffee, bringing them, processing them was so expensive. Just to give you a sense, it was simply a kilogram of coffee to produce and gather was as much as 700 to 800 rupees per kilo it cost us and the wholesale market was 80 rupees. So it made no sense to do coffee there and under those conditions. One was therefore had to scale up and have as many as many farmers as possible so that the volume increases that was one. But the second thing is very early we realized if this has to succeed more than getting the market, this had to be the best coffee. And if, it, if we could create this as one of the best coffees in the world, then we know there was a chance for getting that extra value, as well as with the volume, reduce the cost. So we, we were worried about first getting coffee to highest quality, and then looking at opening it up to niche coffee markets, and getting the best coffee buyers who value quality coffee to be part of our journey. So it, it had to be a dual approach if this had to succeed. And we were very clear we didn't want any subsidized approach. We wanted them to win global markets and be fully profitable and sustainable. What I find most noteworthy is that all of it has been sustainable, absolutely organic. How difficult or easy was it to do it at this scale? We realized that the conventional agriculture was going to be not the future. What I mean by the conventional agriculture is the one where we use chemistry, that is you use urea, you use fertilizers and chemicals to provide nutrition to plants uh, or crops. Ours was going back to nature, which was use biology, use microbes, use life sciences, use natural solutions to produce the chemistry. Once we learned through experts in the field, people who did 20, 30 years, 40 years of these experiments in large scale in different parts of the world, when it was clear that there was a science like this which is better, telling it to these farmers was very easy. Because the moment I told this to the farmers, they said, oh, this is very much in line with what we have heard from our childhood. That is, this is in harmony with nature. There was no chemicals coming and it, it was to my advantage to be fair that most of the region, they couldn't afford chemical fertilizer. I was lucky to get that kind of a community who respected nature, loved nature and believed in the power of nature. So it was easier. It's tougher for me to do the same which I do now in Punjab or Maharashtra or UP 
where they are already remote from nature. Coffee that was being marketed by the government as pretty ordinary coffee for so many years is now specialty coffee that finds place in global markets like Paris. How did you go about unleashing that potential in the region to become a known coffee supplier to the world, so to say? So, this question actually unlocks answer for India's potential in any agricultural produce, not just coffee. If we are going to look at tapping global markets with just commodity sale, we'll never make it big and farmers will never make big profits because com commodities will depend on lowest price points and it won't work. What the, the, the simple question that you ask between coffee and specialty coffee has a very long answer on extraordinary efforts at value addition. Again, to put it in numbers for people who are not familiar with the coffee, if you have to be specialty coffee, you have to consistently, every cup of your coffee that I taste should score above 85 out of 100. Average Indian coffee struggles to make it to 60. So that's the whole story. Roughly around 19 steps are there, from soil to seed. I said this was, this was like sending a rocket or something. It was so detailed. They said people haven't attempted all these 18, 19 steps. Wherever it's attempted, like some parts of Ethiopia, maybe some parts of Rwanda, the, we get only this much coffee. If you can do this in scale across, you will be in the world map and you will be right on top. Can you try it? So that's what I went and told the cooperative. That's what I went and told the farmers. I said, you have an opportunity. You are falling off the map, of the world map. You just, two, you can put India on the world map. And you will create a forest back from known forever as poor tribals. You will be known as the most innovative, enterprising, coffee growers of the planet. These are the choices you have, but it's a disciplined journey for next few years. And I would tell them, trust me, if we do this, this place will become, you know, paved with gold. You know, I used to use those metaphors. This will become a place where the world will come to learn from you. And they said these steps are doable, we'll do it. And so doing those 19 steps, in two, three years, we were already scoring 85 plus. The, the culture of excellence has A, sustained, and now the tribals find it a habit. So you can make excellence a habit, which is so fantastic to know. That's a huge transformation we are talking about, from being a dark valley of the country to now actually finding place in the global map for coffee. Do you think this model can be replicated in other parts of the country? A, for climate goals, B, to help farmers' income, and uplift the rural economy overall and bridge the inequity. Is it a possible, doable thing in other parts of the country? Just the magic that happened in Araku, which is now Arakunomics, <laughs> can it be applied in other parts? Absolutely. I don't know if I would have said this with confidence 10 years ago or maybe even five years ago. But I should tell you that many a time I try to tell people when they compliment me and the team for creating a world-class coffee, I say that, frankly, the greater achievement is to be able to show that large sections of population can be made to transform from just having a very mediocre work ethic or to being obsessed with excellence in every step of their activity. This transformation to me is the greatest achievement. Coffee is just a byproduct. What we are really first probably to do is how do we create and inject and insinuate a sustainable, ethical, non-competitive, but collaborative culture of excellence. I think that is what we are trying to do in other parts of India. So yes, we are replicating already this in Varda region, uh, in Varda district of the Vidarbha region, where farmers' stories have been mostly sad stories, including farmer suicides. 
then we are in Punjab, popularly known as industrious area, very hardworking uh, Punjabi farmers, but struggling to make large profits in large numbers. Agriculture is reduced to just growing rice and wheat for government to buy. All their entrepreneurship has disappeared. So that region is another. Uttar Pradesh, the largest state in India with the largest number of farmers, farmers and the Ganga River flowing right across parts of Uttar Pradesh, you can dig and get water. Such, there is no other more fertile land than that. There, again, farmers, there are no rich farmers with two acres, with three acres. Farmers are struggling and waiting for subsidy and just growing rice often to be purchased by government. So UP we have taken up as another area. We are also looking at Meghalaya, looking at Rajasthan, looking at uh, Goa, different other, uh, I would say, agronomy terroirs to show that the agriculture can replicate. But what we really want to inject is this obsession to be excellent. When I travel in US, they seem to say, oh, India, you guys are good at IT. It's a common response. I would like the world to tell us when it comes to food, if you say it's from India, people are like, thing. And, and that will make becoming a farmer a dream for every Indian. You know, from being a food consumer, I think we should all aspire to be a food producer. People ask me, what is our economic? We call it the PQR, profit for farmer, quality for consumer, regenerative for the planet. If this PQR is ticked, we say that food is the food of the future. And that's what our economics is. In two years, we should be doubling the number of farmers we have in Araku to rest of India. And then the Araku story will spread. What role is the government playing in the translation of this vision? Are they partners uh, in this? So, um, I would say that we were hesitant to approach government as partners because we first wanted to perfect the, the template um, and, and do the experimentation and failures ourselves before we can invite the government to be partners. Mm -hmm. Going forward, uh, uh, we think there are certain areas where we can partner with government. Maybe, for instance, getting government nurseries to give saplings for farmers free so that they can create food forests like we did in Araku. Maybe looking at um, aggregating bio waste to create soil. We could create what I call a thousand soil factories, which is producing top soil, rich in nutrition, nutrients, with government partnerships. So there are ways government can participate. Uh, and we will begin to reach out, reaching out to them. So, Nandi Foundation by philosophy is a charitable trust right. and it's managed by business leaders. But overall, how do you see this actually transforming the way philanthropy is practiced in India? Is this a more viable and effective way of ensuring that philanthropic funds, philanthropic capital reaches the right areas and is put into profitable use? Absolutely. I think Nandi's greatest contribution to the modern Indian history, if you ask me, is the fact that very successful business leaders like Anand Mahindra, before him, Dr. Ranji Reddy of Reddy Labs, and now Chris Gopalakshan of Infosys fame, etc., have come as trustees. When they come, they bring in credibility, but the ability to scale up ideas, um, the ability to open markets, the ability to challenge. So more than anything else, more than all the money they would have contributed, I think their mind share, their commitment to this cause of creating solutions for unsolved problems has been extraordinary. In fact, I would say I would count more and more such successful business leaders um, spending time, their mind share in creating institutions like Nandi. One Nandi cannot change India. We need a hundred. The second part is to say that when, when we had people, business leaders, from beginning, there were challenging questions of efficiency, questions of impact and measurement, and more importantly, sustainability. So the model in Nandi is create the conditions for the real poor communities to be able to compete with market. It's, it's wrong to assume poorest communities 
can straight away compete. You have to create conditions which bring in not just equality but equity to compete. That's what Nandi does. Takes them through philanthropy to a level and say, look, now fight it out in the market because you can. That's what we did. So Nandi, after a stage, creates these social for-profits which become the vehicles for them to compete with it. So Araku, the agriculture work or the forest creation was done through Nandi. But the moment coffee comes into being, it's taken over by Araku, the brand. And the entire rest is done in a business way as a for-profit. So this comp hybrid model of you know, going to the remotest pockets, creating the conditions to compete and then creating brands out of it is what we're doing. How is the project funded? Uh, there is philanthropic capital, but do you also do global roadshows to bring about more capital, maybe from foreign organizations? Uh, there's a huge penchant for carbon credits these days. Are you using that as well uh, to fund many of these programs? I should say you're completely up to date on the philanthropy space. This, this is one of the cutting-edge questions on how nonprofits can pivot in changing times and, and scale up. Uh, so if you look at Nandi Foundation, we have broadly two big buckets of activities. One, which is working with girl children and looking after their education. We call it Project Nandikali. That one purely depends on philanthropy from individuals and companies, especially CSR and we are able to manage quarter million girls every year. But the other major work is with farmers and food system like Araku, uh, Araku Coffee and the work of creating forests. For that, except one, the Mahindra group that supports us through CSR, entire funding has been through global roadshows, to use your phrase. And what we did there was again not pitch for charity we pitched for the fact that we will create functional forests, we will plant trees which give food, which the community can sell and make money. In return for creating these food forests, we will, if you give us money, we will ensure that the carbon sequestered in the soil and by the trees, which can be measured today as carbon credits, we said we will return this to you. That idea that we sold 12 years ago to a clutch of European companies eventually ended up in an entity called Livelihoods Fund in Europe, in Paris, which is Danone, Hermes, SAP, um, you know, Schneider Electric, La Post, various companies. If you know. So they started giving us money which can then deliver large amounts of fil equivalent to philanthropic capital to us, to Nandi. So that, that's an innovation that has come to stay with Nandi for this food and farmer approach to funding. We don't have a large endowment. We have no endowment. So every year we have to raise fresh money. We have annual plans to raise money. And the advantage is we are able to do it from just few people with large commitments. Because if you want carbon credits back, you need to give us money to support the farmers for 20 years at least. Because you need the trees to grow up to 20 years for the investors to get that large amounts of carbon. So the, the world of conscious, sustainable planet has accidentally given birth to an innovative way of financing for us. And I'm, and I'm so happy. I hope many nonprofits copy this model. Sure. So Farmers who were food gatherers are now self-reliant and they are earning as well. Absolutely. What's a farmer's income in that region on an annual basis? So, I'm so proud to tell you that from day one that they start selling their coffee or pepper or any produce, they're assured they never make losses because they have no cost. The model is such that entire cost is funded by us through carbon financing, if I may call it that, and everything they sell and get as income is profit. So on an average today, I will say that almost every farmer there who is working and having a certain quantity of produce to sell 
is more than the national Indian per capita income, first and foremost. From being the bottomest, they have reached this level. So if you look at another yardstick, I would say that we have created over 1,300 millionaires. That is, you make a net profit of at least a lakh. And this is very important to tell you, because if you can make a net profit of at least a lakh from as little as an acre of coffee estate, then that's an unprecedented agriculture success story. As a VC, I would have put money in any such farmer who is talking about this return. But then, if you look at a two to three year cycle and add all the crops they have, coffee, pepper, pulses, etc., then they actually end up making more than 10 lakh net profit from just one land. They are finding freedom. So more and more youngsters are meeting there, despite even an engineering degree or a graduate degree, are telling me that they want to be a farmer and run out, look after their state. This trend is very, very inspiring. How do you plan to unlock this value? For instance, Araku, the brand itself, has become very profitable as a marketing organ for this entire initiative. How do you think this can be further maximized in terms of unlocking value for the stakeholders? So the Araku company or the Araku brand, um, as, as one of the, um, in one of the roadshows, uh, an European businessman told me, you seem to be, interestingly, the first luxury product company which is fundamentally a social enterprise. And I said, I never thought of it that way. He said, yes. And when I look at it, it, that gentleman was right. Because what we have created is a wealth distribution ethos as part of the governance structure itself. So far, all the investments for capital have come from trustees of Nandi. But the, the, the trustees have put the money and that has become our um, Series A as well. So if I really have to go to the market, I need to expand tremendously um, in any one market and require that amount of investment. I think that that time is coming near. For instance, if you decide to replicate Araku coffee model across the United States of America, then we would approach institutional investors to come in. There also, a classic PE or a VC may not be um, a partner because we would want someone who would marry the philosophy which Nandi embodies, which the investors and trustees currently uphold, which is that a model where we will distribute wealth distribute wealth between the investors, between the entire people who made it happen, uh, and farmers, and also the community around farming. If, if that is something somebody signs up, I think it will be the first kind of an impact investment model where we distribute wealth uh, amongst the entire value chain that emerges. Currently, we perfected that in terms of profits. Perfect, uh, we even perfected it beyond farmers. Some of the profit we redeploy to community, be it for ambulance, be it for healthcare, etc. We would like to stretch that for wealth distribution also. Then we would really enhance the idea of capitalism, where we are able to not only allow wealth creation, but also find meaningful, equitable ways of wealth distribution. That's what would be the what I call the last lap of the Araku brand journey. Thank you so much, Manoj. Your story is so inspiring. The Thank work you. you've done at Araku Valley and in other areas that you're trying to bring about change as well. A very powerful transformational story is unfolding. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All I can say is may there be a million Araku stories in India in food so that we will be a world power when it comes to food. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.